Okay, so it's a really long time, even pre-pandemic, since I've given a talk. So uh, forgive me for everything that I do wrong. I will try really hard not to swear for the gentleman at the back. Right, so the first thing I want to talk about is a change in terminology. In fact, let's just ask a little question. Who here has been part of what we lovingly call an agile transformation? <laughs> I know, right? So I am not the first person to say this by long stretch. It's a really bad choice of words because it implies this kind of butterfly thing. You're one and done. Way, we transformed, we're finished. Um, so all the way through this, you'll hear me talking about releasing agility. So a hat tip to my friend Rob Lambert, who we used to talk about this a lot in our little pre-pandemic consultancy world. Releasing agility was this idea that every company has got this like intrinsic agility in it. If you could just get out of people's way and like remove some of the blockers that, that stop people being agile. So it, the idea is it's more incrementally sounding than transformation. So releasing agility, we like. It's a bit more like a dam. Um, and part of what this will cover is the fact that you need everybody on board for doing this kind of thing. Um, I do not enjoy particularly working in corporate worlds. My specialism is the tiny companies that get bought by the big corporates and trying not to break the little company you just bought. So that's my specialty. That's the bit that I love. Um, so. This, I'm going to break with tradition firstly, this is my talk. There is no big reveal at the end. These are the steps that I'm going through. So anybody wanted the quick version, maybe what's a really early lunch, feel free. That's it. Take a photo, we're done. Okay, so these are my five steps for releasing, releasing agility. Um, and they can be applied at all sorts of levels. You can do it at the company level or at the team level. Um, department level. I mean, anything you can do this for. Um, and I'll be giving you little anecdotes that are not largely tech based so that I can explain that this is not about tech, because this is really my big deal with Agile is it's not about tech. Which is really, I really enjoyed Gabrielle's talk this morning. Um, first thing people are going to be quite alarmed about, especially as we're all Agilists here, is that you don't bring in your Agile behaviours until step four. Are you kidding, Helen? Step four. There's a reason for this, and I'm really looking forward to being, tell you, being able to tell you why. So, step one, develop a clear vision and share it. A number of companies I've been to, and they have a vision, but nobody knows it because they've never told it. Or they do share it, but it's indecipherable. So we've all seen those little websites where you can generate speak, techno speak, not techno speak, corporate speak. Um, Develop a clear vision and share it. So, I think I just did that for my talk in my last slide. This is what we're going to talk about. This is the order we're going to talk about it. That's my vision. To be clear about vision, um, it's the state that we aim for. Another phrase my friend Rob Lambert uses is this painted picture idea. The idea is it's this place we're going. We're going on holiday to Japan. Tell me what Japan's like, you know. Um, there's probably no final state because the closer you get to that vision, the further out you're looking. So you're, that, that becomes just a waypoint. But for now, it's your next imagined final state. Um, but it's not about how we get there. So lots of times people will wrap that up in the vision. By doing this, we are going to. As soon as you put by doing, that's not a vision. Vision is what we're doing. Where, what will it look like? when we get there. So tell me about Japan. Don't tell me about the plane ride there. So there are several of these on the way. So if everybody has got a phone, there are several of these. If you do the first two, um, there are, in fact, I think there are four because I cut some out. So log on to menti.com. It's just a website, web browser. Um, put in that number and we're not collecting data, I promise you. It's absolutely anonymous. This is just because I thought it would be kind of fun. <sighs> Internet willing. I'm really worried about doing this now. <sighs> no. Have you got it? Yes. I'm really scared about doing this now. Right. So, 
is not swapped. I can't show you. Can you see on your... Uh, can you see your, the results showing up? No, just the opposite. Oh. Okay. I can't. Oh, the number. Yes, I can show the number. Sorry. All I can do now is not show you the results. So this does work, but I'm so scared of this setup that I don't even want to pick the laptop up. Right. So, this is how it looks. <laughs> <laughs> when we finish this, I'll release it so you guys can see all the results. But it's on the same mentee, it'll be there for a couple of days. Um, basically, most people have said they vaguely know about their, um, <laughs> about their company vision. And uh, if I go along one, there's this one. Do you know how your current project contributes? So most people do, which is really, really nice. Um, Many, the, the, it seems to me the bigger corporates you go into. Uh oh. We're good. The bigger corporates we go into, the less we have. This is not going to work very well, but we'll keep going. Okay. So it's nice. You, you can see what everybody else thinks, what everybody else uh, uh, feels about their visions in their company. So. I was talking about this last night with one of the other chaps here um, about strategy. So strategy is this awesome buzzword and we've, people use it all over the place. Um, sometimes they even use it right, but I couldn't possibly comment. It is not, a strategy is not just a list of things that you want to do. This is your strategy is what gets you to the vision. So if you're thinking about we're talking about my trip to Japan, woohoo. Um, I'm not going to Japan, I just really, really want to. <laughs> so the strategy is your roadmap for getting to Japan. So it's the difference between where you are now and your vision. So in our journey, it's our journey to Japan. So it's plane tickets, it's hotel bookings, it's activities, but it's not the Japan bit. So the Japan bit's your vision, and then how you get there is your strategy. A journey does need a destination, this vision. But I did mention that we need to know where we are now. Because actually, you can't possibly make a plan to get where you're going unless you know where you are now. And one of our big problems is that that requires real honesty. You can't imagine your reality, your place you are now, as better or worse than it really is. Because you're starting from a false place. So you're your, doesn't matter how good your strategy is if you've not assessed where you currently are. And that realism, that honesty is really quite hard to get because sometimes in bigger organisations, the directors aren't necessarily told quite the complete truth about where we are and how good our tech is and how brilliant the sales are really going to be. Um, and that reality is really tough to get to. Um, but... We know today's vision for a start, and we have a strategy. We've got our steps in order. Um, we're not going to have any tactical diversions today because I only had 30 minutes and I've already burned some of those. Um, but there are usually, in any deployment of any strategy getting to your vision, there are tactical eddies, little, little uh, diversions from your strategy that are unavoidable. So I was trying to think of one that would fit in with my little Japan story. And imagine that you are in Japan, you've got your strategy, you're on your way to Japan, maybe you're at the airport, you're not quite there yet. And whoever's looking after your flat and feeding your plants or whatever it is, rings you and goes, you've been burgled. Now there's absolutely nothing you can do about this, but you need to know and you need to do some things. You can't, you can't keep with your vision of going to Japan without doing something about the burglary. And luckily, you can get on the internet, you can talk to them, they can sort things out, get locksmiths, fix it all up, and you can still go on to your vision, but it's taken you some time. You maybe need to get a slightly lighter plane, or you maybe need to give up a day or a couple of half days of your holiday so that you can deal with this. But, but this is the thing about these tactical bits, is they are temporary diversions. They're unavoidable. If you are spending a lot of time 
on tactical diversions, there's something really wrong in your business because you're not moving towards what it is that you really, really want to do. So you've got clear vision, you've got your strategy, you're trying to avoid your little tactical bits and pieces there. The only time I would say that you can manage without a strategy, um, I would suggest is if you are in a really early startup, really small group of really, really very focused people um, with ruthless um, discipline, you can do that startup model for a short amount of time, but you will need a vision and you will need a strategy. Usually your vision will carry you through as it, at the early startups, but the strategy you can omit and do it by discovery in those very early days for a while. Okay, step three, <sighs> look around. Is this the people to get it done? Are these the people to get it done? So this is not just perhaps your peers, not necessarily your people that, you, that report into you, and it's not necessarily um, the entire company as a whole, but there's a reason that Glassdoor do ask people when you're, you're looking at Glassdoor, how comfortable are you with your CEO? That, that is a measure of how, how good that business is, is how happy people are with the CEO. Is this the person who's gonna make those difficult decisions? Do you have confidence that they will? What about the rest of the board of directors? Are they gonna do the things that need to be done? Are you? Are you the person who's going to be able to lead with behaviors and attitude that's going to help your business to achieve the things that your bubble of the, the world needs to get done? Okay, back to the little mentee. So there's one more. This is the third one. Oh, we've got to do the exciting bit again. I know. If somebody works in tech, I am really such a technophobe. Okay, so this is just the question of how confident are you with the people of your team that you're working in right now? How confident are you? And I happen to remember this slide from last time I did this talk, and it, it's about the same, 6.4 out of 10. So most people are really happy with the people. There are a couple of people who are, think we're all doomed, if that's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Not too worrying. <laughs> I know, right? Okay. So, if your answer to that last question was, these are not the people to get it done, you've really only got two choices. <sighs> so, people tend to love the work. If they love the work, they will love doing the work and they will do the work that they absolutely love if you give them half a chance. So if you possibly can, find a way of redeploying your people. Now, if you are a manager, that's much easier than if you are a peer. So I'll come back to that in a moment. But if you are a manager or responsible for people um, in any way, what you need to do is make sure that you understand what it is they love, because if they're not the person to get this job done, what is it that they're really good at? What is it that they could be transformational, for want of using that word, what is it that they would be really adding value to your business to do if we could move them to something they'd really enjoy? And they will ultimately be really pleased for that, usually. Most people don't even reflect as much as we do. So as Agilists, we have a habit already of reflecting on how we're doing. What do I like? What do I not like? How does this serve me? How am I serving other people? Um, Many, many people that we encounter don't. They don't do this self-reflective thing. So just by helping somebody do that, you can make a big difference. The other one is a difficult conversation. And this is, you, you can't avoid these completely, but that difficult conversation of, is this the business you should be in? Is this the company for you? It's really hard because I love all the quirkiness. This is why I came into tech, because it's full of brilliantly quirky people. But not everybody likes this particular company, this particular culture. And some people are stuck in a job and they're too afraid to leave. Um, but taking care of the whole person uh, is the same as taking care of your business. It doesn't have to be a negative conversation. So if you're careful and you're kind, and you have candid conversations, you can make a difference. I once had coffee with a chap who was an adequate software developer, but not really loving it. 
he's now an air traffic controller. That was <laughs> result of me having coffee, and I'm really, really sorry. But Richard's very happy now, so that's great. Um, as a manager, or if you're responsible for people, you can actively manage for performance, and you can actually manage as well for people's personal growth and happiness. But they don't have to start these conversations with a manager. So you can't finish them unless you have sort of autonomy or um, responsibility for that person. They're really hard to finish. But you can start them as a peer. You can start them by having conversations if they are your superior. You can ask a director which bit of his job does he really like? What, you know, what was it that got them into finance? Why did, why did she move into finance as a director? What, you know? Those kind of questions and understanding and asking people their stories is really good and you don't need to be a, a, a superior to them in order to do it. Many companies, obviously, I'm assuming you work in a hierarchical way. Don't start those conversations with, you're really rubbish at your job, I've got some ideas. Just as a hint. <laughs> Just... I shouldn't have to say this. Okay, so this is the one everybody came for, right? Bring in all the agileness. Um, so let's look at why we bring in agile practices so late. Because <sighs> mostly we tend to jump in straight into the tools and, and practices. We know that they work. We do know they work. We can all go in and say, oh my God, you know, I can make such a difference really, really easy. We just need to change these few things. You've unblocked, particularly in tech, you unblock things and things now flow much smoother. And we get better. So we get that little hit of dopamine that goes, yay, this definitely works. We love this agile stuff. Um, but if you stay at that company for any length of time, you'll notice there's a ceiling that you can't seem to break past. And that's because there's a whole load of other processes and systems pinning it in place. So you've created a bit of headroom, you can work away in that in a nice agile way, but you can't break beyond that. And there's a reason for this. Now, I would love, <laughs> this is not my slide, but I, Klaus did this slide and I swear to God, I love him so much for this slide alone. He articulated in one picture what I had struggled to articulate for years. I love this. <laughs> and this shows when, it, when you go into companies, I don't know if anybody else has been into companies. <laughs> it's, it's Klaus's slide. I don't take pictures of my picture of Klaus's slide. <laughs> so many companies, I, I've gone into many companies, and they get all excited, and they'll tell you they want to imp by, uh, implement the uh, Spotify model or the Netflix model. Maybe Netflix isn't the best one to talk about right now, but um, because... And they get upset because they've tried, they've got so far, and then it's stopped, so it didn't really work for us. And there are two reasons for this. Firstly, Spotify, Netflix, whoever you want to choose, they had a certain set of people at a certain point in time and a certain set of problems. Even now, Spotify don't have the same people, the same point in time with the same problems. So you haven't got the people, the time or the problems either. It's different. So you cannot ever cookie cutter anything like this because it won't work. It'll make things better because you're doing good things, but you'll hit this ceiling. And the question I always asked was, really pleased your tech team's working so well. How agile is your finance? And usually you get this blank, in fact, you get this blank look and you can either hear them say, get her out of the business, these are not the questions we want to answer. <laughs> or you get the, I don't even know. And that's the problem, because if your finance model is not modelling Spotify, it doesn't matter what you do in tech, to a degree, you can make it better, but you're going to hit this. So, bringing in your agile tools is at step four. Um, you've known your vision, you've developed your strategy, you've got your team in place, and you need all of that before we can start talking about stand-ups and information radiators and visualising the work. That's why it's step four. It's not that those things aren't really, really important. It's just if you've got the wrong people or you haven't got um, your vision clear, it doesn't matter how good you are at implementing 
information radiators and visualizing the work and creating nice flow, you're going to get stuck for that reason. OK. Right. OK, so the other thing that happens when you get this is that people tend to then, you haven't got your clear vision and people tend to optimize locally. They make their little bubble of the world really, really effective because they don't know how to serve the company. All they know how to do is serve their set of visible objectives. So if you don't give people a vision for the whole company for the next five years or the big dream or whatever it is, everybody's going to optimize for whatever they see as the next thing. And the smaller that bubble, the smaller the distance ahead for that, that vision. OK, so anybody here now feel completely overwhelmed about doing this in their own company? Because that's how I felt when I was writing this talk. I was like, God, yes. But if you go into some of the really even medium sized companies, doing changing that is a big job, right? So you can't fix a single organization yourself. It's just not possible. And that's why we band together and we go out in groups and we we do pieces. We do pieces that we make the world a little bit better. But that's that's the big organizational transformation, that releasing agility takes time because it's a cultural change. Anybody who sat there and thought, yeah, well, the other thing is, Helen, that's the director's job. You're absolutely right. It is the director's job, but they won't necessarily know. And here's a little secret that not everybody knows is that most directors have learned on the job. Most of them have had nothing other than the ability to self-educate and often they aren't particularly reflective people, certainly in their early directorships. And we need to cut them some slack because they are suffering from exactly the same problem as we do when we go in, which is I only have this sphere of influence. We imagine that as a director, you have this huge sphere of influence. You command the company. And the truth is you don't. You only really can influence your direct reports, the people who report into you, and they're going to talk back to you, and that's all going to be coloured through their own ideas and such like. So you don't have visibility across the company. You have visibility down one layer of hierarchy. So be quite kind to them. OK. And the other thing I would say is when you're trying to do this for all companies is, <laughs> big companies, is, and it's uncomfortable for me too, Strike up conversations with people more senior than you. It's quite hard because it's really easy to talk to people who are on the same level as you or in the same department as you. But if you can talk to directors and ask them about their vision and perhaps help them see that their vision may not be understood or even known outside of their circle, they what you're doing is giving them the ability to see into another department. You may find if you can build a nice relationship, again, not starting with you suck. Um, <laughs> if you can build a nice relationship with them, you find that they will often come and seek you out. Can you just tell me about this? Can you tell me about that? How is it feeling? What is the energy like? So that you get those conversations um, coming back to you, which is really nice. OK. So for you, whatever level you're working at, being able to think, who can I influence? How can I influence? Is more important than thinking, how many people can I preach to you? How many people can I show? How many people can I change? This is a massive cultural change. And you won't get any sudden dramatic shifts. There's not going to be a light bulb goes on in a director's head because they had a conversation with you. Believe me, I've tried. <laughs> What happens is this slow, incremental change, and it's this releasing of agility. You are unblocking tiny little parts of the world, and everything's flowing a little bit better. But it takes a really long time because it's cultural change. So last step, continuous improvement as a culture. So all culture is built on repeated behavior, uh, not words in a document. It doesn't matter what you write down if that's not what people do every day. And it's not how they do things every day. It doesn't matter what you write down. I promise you, <laughs> it really doesn't. Um, and this is true at all levels. So once an undesirable culture is in place, it takes a huge amount of effort to shift it. 
And anybody who's seen me talk before know I talk about habits and behavior a lot because this is what, what I love. Um, it's the reason that Blizzard and Uber a few years ago both got rid of large chunks of their senior team because they're trying to reset that culture. Um, and when we're looking to change, the sooner we start, the better. But it's never easy. The later you leave it, the more entrenched that poor behavior is. And it's really like that old story that they say about planting a tree. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is today. And it's exactly the same with culture change. Is it takes huge effort, huge energy and time. And the sooner you start, the better, because it's never going to be easier than it is now. It's only going to get harder. Um, you need to build continuous improvement in so that it becomes a cultural habit. It's what everybody does all the time. Um, or you risk it becoming that same kind of thing, that transformation it is in your head, you know, this one and done. Yes, we continuously improve because we stop and we, we do something every year. We have a, all the directors get together and they look at how the business has gone. Um, if it's not what we do all the time, then we're not releasing agility at all. So we're going to skip this because I haven't got time, but you can fill it in if you like, it's very frivolous. Um, <laughs> um, and I'm going to bring you, so these are uh, the five steps of Agile leadership, but I want you to see if you can see through this list to the heart. There's an Agile heart in this, which is, number one, know what you're building. <laughs> number two, know what's essential and prioritize accordingly. Uh, number three, build the team to get it right, get it done, right? Number four, implement solid working practices. And I am not an agile evangelist in any... I, I've, I've worked in so many places that I've seen everything work. So even waterfall will work. I know it's sacrilegious to say this here, but it will <laughs> in some circumstances. <laughs> and the last one, build continuous improvement into your culture. Inspect and adapt. That's all it is. So, agile leadership stuff isn't impossible. It is just difficult. Um, but we can do difficult things because we've been doing it for years. It's just think bigger, wider. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.